Good morning. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Billy Vanskoy, and I am the assistant pastor here at Crossroads Community Church. In my past, growing up, so for me growing up, I would do my homework <clears throat> at my desk in my bedroom, sitting in front of the TV set. I don't recommend it, kids, but I mean, that's how I did it. I didn't really have to study a lot. So what I would do is on my desk, I had a globe. Not too, not too dissimilar to this. It was a little, little smaller. But I'd sit at my desk and I'd, I'd spin it and I'd rotate it around, doing a lot of this because I, I, I move around a lot. This, I think, was the original fidget spinner because I'm, I'm not kidding. I would just like spin it, do my homework, watch TV, do my homework, spin it. But I would look at places on the globe and say, hey, I'd like to go there. Uh, Germany. I've always wanted to go to Germany. I've never been. My dad was when he was in the army. But, you know, it's, it's a globe. And I thought about today putting it right here, but it, it does one of these numbers. It slides down. And what would happen in, invariably is as it slid down, I would pick it up and I'd start playing with it. So if you can humor me, I'm going to sit it down in the front here. And I think I've got like a religious thing about it too. So you know, just like that old song, he's got the whole world. He's got the whole world. He's got the whole world. You all are amazing. <laughs> See, I, I thought, I just thought of that today. Not the song, but just like putting, getting you all to sing. So thank you. So there's the, G Jesus got the whole world in his hands. So it's right in front there. I'm not going to play, tempted, be tempted to play, but I can't even see it now. But, it, but there it is. Um, this message that I'm going to speak to you, when, when Pastor Bobby asked me, hey, do you want to preach one of the Sundays I'm gone? I knew I had to do so. For you see, this message has been on my heart literally for months. And and like, okay, Bobby and his cows, I've been ruminating on it for literally months. And there's a few people in here that I've, I've kind of talked to and said, hey, this is what God's talking to me about, but it hasn't coalesced into any type of a message. Well, it has now. And, and God speaks through me in some strange ways. And, but he told me, this is what I want you to do today. And I'm going to let you know it's, uh, you know, there's going to be an audience or congregational participation in it. Yeah, so buckle up. Um, <clears throat> you know, there is, no, normally on the back of the bulletin, there's sermon notes. There's little uh, blanks you would fill in. So if you're a visitor, it's blank today. And it's blank today on purpose. Because I didn't want, I did not want you all to be writing things down a lot. I mean, it's, it's fine if you do, but I'll, I won't kick you out. But I just wanted to have you pay attention to what we're doing, because this message, I think, is a lot about doing and understanding, really, God's heart for you all, okay? So it's real, that was our real important why I wasn't lazy, I, I wasn't like too late to get it in. This message is really for you all to participate in. And by doing so, I, I really believe and feel that God is going to speak through all of the actions we have here today. Okay? All right, good. So we're going to take part in a demonstration, and we're all going to be part of a demonstration. And so what I need, I need really one, one good team. And so I asked Dan to come on up here. Now, for those of you who do not know, Dan, oh, it's already one. This is in case you need to call people, okay? Okay. All right, okay. So just Dan... Not like phone a friend or anything. You'll understand in a minute. Dan really has no idea what I'm going to do. I love it. So <clears throat> Dan, if you don't know, he's, he's a teacher. He's a, an, an educator. He's like the, the top dog at the school he has. He is, you're like, you could be called Dan the man if you really wanted to, but he is, he's a top dog. He's so, I mean, really, that's why I'm a step down, because I don't feel like I can be up here with Dan right now, okay? Don't laugh, it's true. So, so Dan, in fact, today, I think the title that I'm going to give him is Rabbi Dan, okay? So he's an important dude. <laughs> you, really, you really are. Now, everyone over here in the right section, 
you all are fantastic. You are, are the best and the brightest we have here today. You all, I mean, seriously, you look good. And not only do you look good, you're fantastic. And part of the reason is you're fantastic is because you love Dan, excuse me, Rabbi Dan. In fact, what I'm going to ask you to do so that he fully gets it is on the count of three, just say, we love you, Rabbi Dan. One, two, three. We love you, Rabbi Dan. Now, all you all remain silent because, just because. So Dan, I mean, seriously, they love you. I mean, they, they seriously love you. And now what we're going to do here in a few minutes is we're going to do something. We're going to do a, a task. And it's going to be <clears throat> something biblical, super biblical. It's going to be godly. It's going to be God-pleasing. And it's going to be, and I'll, I'll probably overuse the word a lot, awesome. Okay? So you're, you all are going to do it. Okay? Fantastic. So in order to do this, Rabbi Dan needs to pick four people from the group that's perfect. And you know, you're, you are so perfect, not only because you love Dan, and he knows that now, um, but not only, not only that you love Dan, you're sitting on the right side. You're the right group, if you will. Um, you're, you love Dan. You sit near the kitchen so that if you're hungry, you can get food. But more importantly, if Rabbi Dan's hungry, you all can just jump up and grab him food and you love Dan. I mean, that's just, you all are amazing. You all, I mean, just kind of like, you see it, but okay, just hang out. This is the best group. So anyway, uh, Rabbi Dan, I need you to pick four people for this demonstration of this awesome, amazing God, biblical thing you're going to do, and it's going to wow God. So go ahead, just pick four people. Well, I'm going to pick people that love oh, wait a minute, me. Wait a minute. One second, I forgot the most important thing. Oh, no. You all all want to be up on stage with Dan because he is your rabbi. But Rabbi Dan needs to know that you want to be picked. So he just, he wants to make sure he gets the right, the right group out of here, like the cream of the crop. So if you will, on the count of three, say, pick me, Rabbi Dan. One, two, three. Okay. So, I mean, it's all up to you, my brother. Well, I'm going to pick Charles. Charles, good and Mike. choice. And Mike. I need, need some girl power here, so right. maybe Valerie. Awesome. You're great. And Valerie. Deborah. Please, Deborah. Please mm. report to the team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is fantastic. Y'all, you go up with Rabbi Dan. He called you up with him. This is, a, this is an incredible it's good team to be you have the rabbi. here. <laughs> rabbi Dan, I'm, I'm really impressed with your team. You got a really solid team. I mean, just great people. So I just, again, in just a few minutes, you're going to do something fantastic, just awe-inspiring, biblical, and it's just going to amaze God. So talk about what you're going to do, and then I'll get back to you in a minute. Okay. Well, oh, turn Yance the mic off. Yeah, yeah. Hey, go ahead and turn the mic off because you don't want to give it, give it away. You know, it's all good. Okay. You all. So, good morning. I'm sorry you're not involved in what's going on over there. I mean, you didn't make it. You, you could have... You could have chosen to be over here today to be part of the, the in crowd, the best, the brightest... But you didn't make the right choices, so, so you didn't sit over there. You're here, and that's okay. But I know this is seemingly comical and kind of funny and, and totally different, but I need you to fully understand that God told me to do this. So this is, this is right on with what God's speaking to me. So I'm going to pick a team. But before I do, I'm going to ask this one thing. Father, you know exactly what's going to take place right here. You know what's going to happen. Lord, you've, you've put this into my heart, your plans. So, Father, in Jesus' name, tell me who to pick. Derek, you're amazing. Come, join me. Thank you. Jillian, you don't...
daughter, you are my daughter, but God, God smiles upon you. Come, join me. Willie, God has told me weeks ago to call you up here to do this. Come, join me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Lord, who's next? Ruth. You are my New Yorker. <laughs> strong, strong, solid, but a teddy bear on the inside. God told me to call you. So, Dan, Rabbi Dan, if you just give me a, a second, I want to say one thing to my team and then. Uh... We're back, we're on. Okay, go. Our team is going to lead the entire congregation in singing Jesus Loves Me. Mm. So just follow their leadership, please. Mm. Everyone, arise. <laughs> and I know one of us can sing, so I'm going to delegate the <laughs> singing part. <to> you. <clears throat> Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Hey, well done. Well done. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Team. My team, if you will, go ahead and go ahead. Go ahead and do what you're going to do. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. Hmm. So, so my team, what did you all do? Oh, oh yes. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Y'all can be seated. Wow, my team changed the world, and not only did they change the world, but how did they do it? Quite simple, they brought the light to the world. Just, just, just saying. <laughs> they changed the world. They brought the light to the world. Jesus said, or in John chapter 8, verse 12, it says that when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's what he said then, but it's the same for you. If you know Jesus, you have the light of life. You're a city on a hill that cannot, the light cannot be extinguished. Change the world. You know, um, there, there's probably going to be a few of you in here who kind of, kind of complain and say that the contest was kind of rigged, <laughs> that I knew what was going to happen the whole time, that it was kind of a setup. And, you know, I thought about that a little bit. And I thought, well, it was no different than it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked on the earth and he did the very same thing. He knew what was going to happen. He followed what God told him to do and he knew what was going to take place. So for all of you Pharisees who are rather upset, 
stop being so sad, you see? So, there. Some of you will get it, sad, you see, we'll get it. Just kind of went over a little bit, but that's okay, that's good. My point today, however, is not so much that Jesus did that, that the disciples went out and changed the world and brought the light to the world. My point today is who he did it with. Months ago, I shared during a communion time about the humanity of Jesus and really what he did during communion time, where he sat in the servant's role, how he, who he ate with, Judas, really. He, he dipped with Judas. You know, he was so human in that moment during that time of communion. And just like right then when Jesus picked his disciples, he was very human about it. And I don't mean it in a derogatory way. I just mean it wasn't like a white robe, powerful deity figure coming down there and swooping and choosing. No, he was very human. Come, follow me. Very, very human. In selecting his disciples, Jesus did a radical thing, like totally radical thing of, of picking these men. If you were here last week, Pastor Bobby mentioned a little bit about this, and I thought he was stealing my thunder for today, but he talked about how the disciples were from all walks of life. They, some were fishermen, some were uh, political activists, uh, some were tax collectors and common people and uncommon people. Some were highly educated and others were, were not, I mean, quite simple. Some were rich and some were poor. But yet these disciples that he chose, they changed the world. You're here because of them. But how strange was it that these men were selected? I mean, how just off the wall strange was it that these men were selected? And so that you can appreciate this, I, I, in their magnitude of their selection, um, we're going to learn some details about what it meant to be a disciple during Jesus' time. So, a little bit of geography, a little bit of history. Sam, do you have that? I could, it's somewhere over here. I can't see it, but okay. There's, there's the Sea of Galilee, um, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. Well, down below Tiberias, on bottom, on my way, bottom left, is Nazareth. And in Nazareth was where we might know that Jesus was from or he lived there, born in Bethlehem, but went over to Nazareth. And so he was there in about 15 miles southeast of Nazareth was a town called uh, Scathopolis. Very Greek-sounding name. But this place is often not what we think of when we think of a, a town or a city back in that day. And, and there, you may ask, well, well, why not? Well, because this place was phenomenal. It definitely had a Greek influence to it. For example, it had an arena in it, a big arena in it. It also had a theater in it. It, it contained a university, so people were educated. It had temples. The place had running water in it. It had wide streets so commerce could go up and down. It also had working sewer system in it. I mean, this place was the bomb, if you will. This place was probably a really cool place to visit, perhaps. But yet Jesus didn't pick one of his disciples from this place. It's like he avoided it. He just totally didn't go there. So you may ask, well, where did he go? Well, Bethsaida, up in the upper, upper right there, Bethsaida was a small village, a small rural kind of fishing village on the north, northeast part of the Sea of Galilee. And it had a few hundred people in it. And in this, and in this place, it also, the, the few hundred people mostly were like nuclear and extended families. So it's just a whole lot of family people all there living together in kind of like a community, small community. And... Um, it was, like I said, it was a very simple backwards, if you compare it to um, 
Scythopolis, but it was backwards to that place. But yet in this community, Jesus went there and picked his first five disciples, including, well, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Philip. So for this little tiny place, Jesus tapped into a gold mine of disciples from right there. So this northern triangle up there above the Sea of Galilee was kind of a, a place where a whole lot of discipleship training took place for the Jewish culture. A lot of discipleship training went, went in there. And the town that you see, Chorazin, right up there, it was a, it was a bigger place, probably not as big as Cathopolis, but it had a, a couple thousand people in it. And in this place, there was what they, what you would expect, the synagogue. And the synagogue was the place to get uh, spiritual guidance. It was, it was the whole thing about the town. Every, the, the synagogue was it, the place where everything happened. But in, probably one of the most important things it did was it was a place where the children were taught. So kids were sent to the synagogue in Chorazin and they would learn how to read, write, and actually recite the Torah. So these children totally were immersed in what God said from the Torah. They, they could recite it. They, they knew it. They, it was in them. You know, they knew it. And everyone until about the age of 13 would go to the synagogue and learn. So you really had a society there that were educated and very learned, especially in what God said, what God had said to them. Very, very, very powerful then. But after about the age of 18, the girls or young ladies, they would stop their education and they would either go to, back to the family and do the family chores or perhaps they'd even get married. The boys, on the other hand, they would just be, okay, thank you, you can now go, and they would go learn the family business as well. Carpenter, fisherman, stonemason, whatever. They, they went to learn there. They went back to their family and learned as well. But a few boys, just a few boys, that had the ability and passion for what they were studying, they would continue to go on, and they would learn more. They'd learn about the prophets and what the prophets said. They would, they would absorb more material and they would learn, and they would, they would be kind of like tutored, if you will, under the, under the presence of a rabbi who was really training them and watching them and seeing these boys. And out of that group, there were even a fewer. And those fewer that showed talent and understanding in the scriptures and what the prophets were saying, who really, who really possessed something special, they would go even a little bit further. So again, we're, we're segregating more and more and more and more down. And finally, the cream of the crop, the really good, I mean the ones that were, you know, spectacular, they would go, um, they would go and actually learn even more, and they would... Um, be given the ability to be called what's, and if you know Hebrew, I don't, I'm just going to say the word, how it phonetically sounds to me. They would become what's called a Talmud. And in uh, the plural form is tel, Talmudium. And Talmud and Talmudium are the words that we use for disciple. Those cream of the crop were allowed to become a Talmudium. So in the West, you know, in our culture here, in our culture here, we think of disciple as being someone who wants to know what the person knows. Like for going back to Rabbi Dan, we think that, we might think here that you all in the right side, you want to know what the rabbi knows. And that's what it means to be a disciple. But it's not the case. That's, that is not the case. To be, the word tell me diem really means you want to become 
exactly like the rabbi in their walk with God. You don't want to just know what he knows. You want to be able to follow every single thing that he does. Literally, that when people see you, they might see a reflection, actually, of your rabbi. That's what it means. It's such a high, high level of commitment. Such a high level of commitment. This level of devotion uh, requires that the person who is the Talmud, or the Talmudium, is, is consumed with a drive to become that, to become like the rabbi. So a question I have for all of you, myself included, is do we, as, as Christians, as followers of Christ, do we have that commitment with Jesus that we actually fit the definition, the true definition of Talmud? All right, I mean, it's a rhetorical question. You have to answer it yourself. Do you have it? So let's just say you did have all these qualities back then. You're on the right side. You're the, you know, the golden children. You're the, the top of the top, the cream of the crop. You're, you're that, that little slice that says you can be a Talmud. I mean, you asked Dan earlier, or Rabbi Dan, excuse me. You asked him earlier, hey, choose me, pick me. So... You all are that part. What would it take? What would it take for you to become that tell me, tell me DM with Rabbi Dan? The first thing you did was you go to him. You went to the rabbi and you asked him, can I be your disciple? You know, like you did. Pick me. You asked him, can I be your disciple? And then the rabbi would watch you and see how you act. See if you could handle the situation. See what you really knew. See if you had the skills and the knowledge and the understanding that he would want to be associated with you for you to be, you know, one of his charges, if you will. And then after a period of time, then he would say to you, come, follow me. So you think you made it, but actually now the real work begins because then you would spend many years, years getting trained. And I don't mean it's like an eight to five kind of job. You literally spent 24 hours of your life every day for years with the rabbi. You watched him. He spoke into your life. You learned from him. He spoke into your life. He encouraged you. You did what he said. You gave up everything to do what this man would say. It was consuming. And then maybe, just maybe, one day you've arrived. You are now a rabbi yourself. Congratulations. The problem with all of this is most people were turned down. I mean, most people were turned down to, to be a rabbi or to be like the rabbi, because it required an unbelievable amount of discipline and fire inside for you to just give up everything to do it. So most gave up and went back to the family business. But I want you to notice something about Jesus. He messed the whole system up. If you have your Bible, I want you to please open to Luke 5, Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read that passage. I know, it's, I know it's up there too. I'm just going to read it. I'll be like Bobby, put some glasses on. Oh yeah, that's much better. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gethsemane, also known as the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little f from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. 
When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out a little deeper into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the net. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. The rabbi, the rabbi waited for someone to come. Instead, Jesus went out and found people doing ordinary things and said, come, follow me. Now, don't think that these people like Jesus, who Jesus picked were, don't think that they thought Jesus was some type of flake or, or just, you know, they never seen this guy before. No, they knew who Jesus was. They'd seen the miracles that he, had, that he did. And even in John chapter one, verse 40, it shows that Andrew and another, my guess it was probably his brother, Simon. But Andrew and uh, Simon followed him for a while after John the Baptist called him, called Jesus uh, the Lamb of God. So Andrew and Peter were following Jesus for a while, and then they just kind of went away. They, they went back to what they knew, to be fishermen. And they stayed that way until Jesus met them up again and said, come, follow me. These guys, <laughs> sounds weird. These gentlemen, these people, these people just like you and I, they did not have the training. They did not have the skill or any of the things that the rabbi looked for in a disciple. They must have thought, you know, We'll just be godly fishermen, and we're not good enough. We can't sit with them. But Jesus essentially tells them, I think you could be just like me. And that's what he says when he chose each one. I think you can be just like me. Think about it. That's what he's told to each one of us. You can be just like me. Crazy. He picked ordinary people who hadn't made the all-star team. He picked people who weren't the synagogue valedictorians or the top of the class, you know, the best and the brightest. He wasn't looking for models, though. He was looking for real people. He chose people that could be changed by his love, and then he sent them out to communicate to the world that his love is open for everyone. His acceptance is available to every single person. Even those people whose lives were marked by failure. So we may wonder what Jesus sees in us when he calls us to be his disciple. Let me say, why me, God? But we must believe that Jesus accepts us. And in spite of our own humanity, he can use ordinary people just like you, just like me, to do something like change the world. It's like a moment in your life when someone says to you, I believe in you. I totally believe in you. Jesus said to them, to each one of the disciples, he said, I believe in you, I know you, and you can be just like me. And he says that to each one of 
us. These, guys, these disciples, they didn't have it, whatever it was. They didn't have it. Yet they knew that through Jesus and the grace of God, they could be just like Jesus. Just like him. Now Jesus went to them and told them to follow him. And he initiated the relationship with them. He is the one who sought them out on his own to make them his disciples. Again, going against what the rabbi protocol was back then. He went in it, but, and so if Jesus did it, did it this way with them, why do, would we think that he would do anything different with us today? Jesus is very clear that he chose us and that the choice is not a matter of how, how we feel about him or our relationship with him, but it's his to us. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16, he said, remember, you did not choose me. I chose you. And no matter how you might want to take that or how, it, how he said it, did he say it like very strong? Like, remember, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Or did he say it kind of in conversation? Like, hey, remember, you didn't choose me. I chose you. However he said it, however he said it to you, there's one common denominator in that whole thing. It's acceptance. He chooses you in spite of yourself. You can't refute that. And note that we awesome, well, awesome, we all perhaps likely think and assume that the disciples were great men of faith right, right after this moment or that they met Jesus or that they began to follow him. Like their faith was like through the roof and it's just not the case. They had to grow. They weren't there like the rabbi at times. They had to grow and let Jesus kind of build them up and all of that. And although it took time for Jesus' call and his message to get through to every one of those disciples, they followed. They kept following. In the same way, we do, we do the exact same thing. We may question and falter at times in our lives. Like, Jesus, are you really there? You know, we may get a little dry seasons and we may think we need to walk away or, or maybe we're like Peter and Andrew where for a period of time, we're just kind of backing off as a Christian. But yet, when Jesus says, come, follow me, we follow. We push through, we follow. It took time for these guys to develop and grow in their walk with Christ. These men took the time, though, to spend, um, to spend with Jesus. And since then, the world has never been the same. It's our time now. It's our time to be those men. Worship team, if you'll go ahead and come on up. And the people that are responsible or have the blessing and the privilege just to pray with everyone, please come up as well. So, as I'm closing today, I completely and totally want you to understand that Jesus chooses you right where you are, for who you are, simply for who you are. It's a, it's a message that God wanted me to share with you today. There's nothing you can do to get away from his love. Nothing. There's nothing. He calls you the apple of his eye. He loves you immensely. He wants you reminded of that. He wants you to know that you are the ones now who are to go out and change the world. To be that light that's on a hill that shines bright. That in a dark situation, it's you he, who he says, I believe in, I believe in you. He does. He absolutely believes in you. Perhaps there's people here today who say, I, I don't believe in myself. Perhaps you're like the Andrew and the Peter 
You've been solid, but life gets in the way and you've kind of just pulled back a bit. I'm telling you, today is the day where Jesus says, come follow me. Let's go. Perhaps there's those out here today who have no idea who Jesus is, but right now there's, there's a tugging going on that something just, there's something inside that you just need to release. Perhaps you know it's Jesus right now calling you and saying, come, follow me. That he believes in you. He does. I encourage you, if that's you, come on up, share. Share with one of these people who wants to pray. It's exciting. Perhaps there's people out here and you've got a sickness. There's something that's wrong with your body. Look, I believe if Jesus says that we can change the world, then through Jesus and the grace of God, we can ask for healing to take place right now. And I believe and I have seen miracles take place. If that's you, do not leave this place the same way you came in. Do not. I will say, go on a limb to say, you'll be foolish to walk out here without getting prayed for. That's not condemnation. That's simply imploring you to have your life changed today. It's that simple. God loves you. He's crazy excited about you. He really is.